morning, people. Welcome back to F Politics, a place where, unlike other places, we respect experts. And so in response to Rishi Sunak's announcement today about mental health, I figured I'd speak to Natasha Devon, the mental health campaigner, the UK's first mental health czar in government, and host on LBC. Okay. Hi, Natasha. Hi, Femi. So we just watched Rishi Sunak announcing his plans to attack benefits for those who are off work due to primarily mental health conditions. And he said that his main aim was that people with less severe mental health conditions should be expected to engage in the world of work. And if you believe, as I do, the growing body of evidence that good work can actually improve mental and physical health, then it becomes clear we need to be more ambitious about helping people back to work. So we're going to tighten up the work capability assessment such that hundreds of thousands of benefit recipients with less severe conditions will now be expected to engage in the world of work. I think the problem is that Rishi Sunak and Mel Stride have taken two things which are kind of true, but pivoted them so they can use them for nefarious purpose. So it is true that working and structure can be good for your mental health. However, forcing someone to work when they are unable to do so, when, when they've reached a point with their mental health where they're unable to do so is absolutely catastrophic. The other thing um, that he says in, in the um, clip, too often medicating life's everyday challenges. I think what he's doing there is interpreting something which I've heard psychologists and psychiatrists and experts in this field argue a lot which is mental ill health is this huge umbrella term. And it can be used pretty much by anyone who is in psychological distress. And your response, if somebody is experiencing exam stress, for example, would be different if somebody was going through an episode of psychosis because they had bipolar disorder. Yep. Those two things require a different response. And a medical route or a therapeutic route is not always appropriate. But what that doesn't mean then is that you tell the person who has exam stress to be more resilient and to have a stiff upper lip and that they don't require any support. Because one thing that we know about mental health issues is like any form of health issue, the longer you leave them, the more chronic they become. And this is what is so frustrating for me watching this speech because in 2012, I wrote to Michael Gove and I said, these changes that you're making to the education system where you are defunding essentially and devaluing things with a proven therapeutic value in schools. So things like sport, art, music, drama happening concurrent with the stripping of educational psycho uh, psychological services, social services, children and adolescent mental health services is going to have a negative impact on young people's mental health. Then in 2015, when I was the government's mental health czar, I was talking about austerity and more children being in poverty, struggling financially, and the negative impact that would have on their mental health. This was before COVID. This was before the war in Ukraine and all the other things that the government blames everything on. So when you talk about things like the defunding of the arts and saying that those aren't real subjects, that has a knock-on impact onto the mental health of young people. Yes, because um, not only what Michael Gove did was First of all, stripped away the coursework. So now you have children who have two, sometimes three years of their education pointing at their exam performance on this one day. Increased testing and put more tests and assessments in for younger and younger children. So that increased the pressure. Mm -hmm. At the same time, took away things which allow children to express themselves emotionally and allow children who aren't as gifted academically, perhaps, but have talents in other areas to feel valued and part of the school community, like sport, art, music, drama. And it's ironic that if you're struggling with your mental health, you're very often prescribed sport or art or, or music. And these were the very coping tools that were taken away from children. Those children that I was talking about then are now Gen Z in the workplace. Well, they always were Gen Z, but now they're at yeah, work. Yeah. And they are being called generation sick note because they're struggling in exactly the way that I predicted that they would, leaving them unable to work. And rather than engage with that, we have Rishi Sunak trying to pretend that the problem isn't real. Yeah, he, he specifically targeted young people saying that, that uh, 
uh, saying that they were, they were the issue. And I find it incredible that he seems to, at several points during his speech, point to the pandemic as the reason, uh, as saying that bef- since the pandemic, things have gotten much worse, as if there isn't a causal factor there, as if the fact that the people who went through the pandemic, especially young people were especially hurt by this, be it the disruption to their exams, be it the disruption to their applications for university, be it the fact that when they tried to enter the world of work, they were then separated immediately from people, given the fact that the years that are usually the most social years of somebody's life were then the least social of anybody's lives. And those were completely destroyed. And it's surprise, surprise, then complains that, I think the phrase he used was um, nearly half of those who are, who are, on a, uh, who are out of work are say they're suffering from anxiety or depression. Well, that's surprising. Exactly. And the pandemic, I think what it did was it exacerbated a lot of the issues that were already there. And the thing that's frustrating about that is the same thing that's frustrating about this is when you oscillate between two binary points of view, you never hit the truth. So what we've had for a long time is a lot of people who do not believe that mental ill health is real because you can't see it. Mm-hmm. And campaigners like myself and many, many others within the field have worked so hard to try and reduce that stigma. We seem now to, what Rishi Sunak seems to be encouraging a swing back to the point of view of it, it's not serious, it's not real, people are malingering, they're swinging the lead. Mm-hmm. And exactly the same thing happened with the pandemic. Lockdowns are harmful to mental health, particularly lockdowns at the wrong time. But that didn't mean that the lockdowns were unnecessary. What was frustrating for me during that time was, okay, if you know you need to lock down and you know that that's going to adversely affect people's mental health, why do you not take that knowledge and put in some resources and support so that you can minimize the damaging effects? But people didn't do that. They just argued of these two binary positions of you know let the virus sweep through the nation or Mm -hmm. lock everyone up forever you know yeah no during that time was incredibly frustrating because i remember speaking to a uh a a bacteriologist from harvard who was explaining the fact that lockdown the purpose of it is not to completely eliminate the disease it's to pause the disease so that you can give yourself enough time to essentially covid proof the economy so that you can actually get on with life without spreading the disease as much and you talked about putting things in place, um, the, the tools to help people with their mental health. Now, you mentioned arts before, also um, sports centres, um, activity centres for young people, those sorts of things, which the government has routinely defunded. I mean, you had Rishi Sunak talking about defunding deprived urban areas. That is about getting rid of um, youth services. That is about getting rid of the things that help keep young people mentally healthy. Um And just to go back to what you said about, well, the phrase that Rishi Sunak used was... ...about the risk of over-medicalising the everyday challenges and worries of life. I find it a bit rich to complain about people's everyday life having having a knock-on effect on their mental health when you've made their mental health, their everyday lives worse. Your policies have increased the level of poverty that people go through. And the more poverty they go through, the more they are at risk from mental health issues because the increased stress on their lives. I know that personally, um, as you know, Natasha, my mental health recently has not been ideal. And that's been largely because um, the category of work that we do, the level of stress that I've been under, um, sustained over the last seven years without really taking any holidays, leaves very little room for things to go wrong in my personal life. And so when it does, it takes me over the limit and I kind of had a bit of a crash. So. If you're going through poverty, if you're trying your hardest at every single second to try and make ends meet, to put food on the table for your family, to pay bills, to make things just run smoothly, your ability to take knocks is going to be lower. And so when he talks about us over medicalizing the everyday facts of life, it sounds like he's being such a dick because his policies have made that worse. Exactly, that's exactly right. And he's what he's trying to do is he's trying to divorce mental health from life, but the two are inextricably linked. And like I say, they, they work on a sliding scale. So um, when I'm talking to young people about, we talk about emptying the stress bucket, and there are various ways that you can do that. But the idea is if you take time each day to empty your stress bucket, as long as nothing massive is happening in your life that would cause a kind of overflow of stress, you're keeping your levels manageable. And that is the mental health equivalent of brushing your teeth, right? It's not negotiable. It's something everyone should be doing every day. So what Rishi Sunak has essentially done is 
taken away the ability of huge swathes of the population to brush their teeth every day and then gone, mm. they must be lying about all of their teeth falling out. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the worst thing he said was... Um... In 2011, 20% of those doing a work capability assessment were deemed unfit to work. But the latest figure now stands at 65%. That's wrong. People are not three times sicker than they were a decade ago. Yeah, I, I just can't fathom, as the Prime Minister of this country, looking at statistics which appear to show that the population is three times sicker than they were a decade ago, and not immediately asking the question, why is this happening? Yeah, if, if three times more people than a decade ago currently had a broken leg, you would say there is something in the environment of these people <laughs> that is causing them to have a broken leg. Yeah, yeah. How can we fix that? But instead, he's just flat out denied that the population is is not three times sicker than it was, as though that's fact. I don't even know where he gets that assurance from. Yeah, it's not like we've been through a pandemic. It's not like that caused major major waiting list additions to an already horrendous waiting list for the NHS, leading to lots of diseases going untreated, etc. For a, for a very long time, meaning that we are obviously going to be significantly sicker. And it's the it's the denial. I remember there was that thing about um, autism and. Uh, and neurodivergence and the argument that well it's being diagnosed all, diagnosed all the time and we haven't suddenly become um, more um, more autistic and people made the point that if you look at the levels of left-handedness in America they actually tracked that over time and it was very very low for a long period of time during which during which time there was a lot of stigma against people who were who were left-handed and then when that stigma disappeared suddenly lots of people were left-handed and it's like well no, people didn't suddenly become left-handed. No, it's now just being actually spotted. Mm. I, honestly, Femi, if there was one bit of scientific literacy I could introduce to the population, and particularly politicians, it would be, please understand the difference between there's been a huge increase in this thing, and we have only just started acknowledging and measuring this thing. You can yes, see yeah. it with trans people, ADHD mm -hmm. and autism, and and mental health as well, because, you know, that stigma does still exist as, as much as I, I think Rishi Sunak would love you to believe that we're all talking about it all the time. Yeah, there are probably certain parts of the population for which there's very little stigma. But for other groups, it's still incredibly hard to talk about what's happening in your head. It would be wrong to merely sit back and accept it because it's too hard, too controversial or for fear of causing offence. I find that incredible because he's implying that anybody who has an issue with taking away the living support of the most literally vulnerable people in the country is just being too sensitive, is a snowflake, is being too politically correct. It's the same old argument, isn't it? It's uh, snowflakery or wokery. Anytime a politician wants to say something which is by any measure egregious and offensive and wrong, they evoke this imaginary cabal of woke people who would hate them to say it so that people who agree with them can feel like they're the victims in, in the scenario. And it, it's incredibly rage inducing that you, over the past 10 years, we have seen more and more things which are incredibly important being absorbed into the culture wars. It's not the environment, now it's mental health. But if you have a low level mobility issue, your employer could make reasonable adjustments, perhaps including adaptations to enable you to work from home. So what do you say to that? What, what do you say to the idea that, well, these people can work if they just make adjustments and, and work from home? Again, I think we're being presented with this as though it's a binary choice when it's not. For a lot of people, flexible working and the ability to work at home and their employer being prepared to make those adjustments will make a tangible difference to their lives. For other people, that is not what they need right now. And I, it's kind of a, a clever thing to do because you hear him say that you think, oh, that sounds quite reasonable. Yeah, you know, that person should be given adjustments and they should. But that's not going to be applicable across the board to everybody who is not in work right now. It's also interesting in the sense that, yes, the employers could make reasonable adjustments that could allow some people that do have these disabilities to work from home. The answer is to give employers more ability or put more pressure on employers to do that, not to take away the benefits from people 
in those situations. It, it's, it's similar to what we saw during the pandemic where they were like um, uh, telling employers um, you should be able to fire people who don't come back to work rather than <laughs> forcing employers to make reasonable adjustments. It was it was all backwards thinking. Uh, you have said a mouthful there, Femi. I, honestly, I get so frustrated. I, I'm the co-founder of a campaign called Where's Your Head At? And at the heart of it is a very simple law change around mental health first aid in the workplace. But we also do other stuff around best practice to support employees' mental health at work. And the reticence of this government to put in any kind of rules and regulations for employers mm -hmm. to the extent that they will say, no, we're not going to introduce this standardization because ideally employers would do more than that. And essentially we'd be setting the bar so low that that's all that they would do, which is a nonsense because employers that get it, get it. Yeah. And yeah. those <laughs> that have employers that don't get it right now are getting nothing. Um, it's a, a source of endless frustration to me that they they won't actually um, address the people who hold the power. Yeah, it, it's... It's, it's, it's two, there's two issues with that. Their natural allies are the CEOs. Their natural allies are the rich people who have the, who have the power. And so they don't want to piss off their people they went to school with. Um, those are the people who actually em empathize with. And it's that constant sense of, oh, but we just trust employers to do the right thing. They'll do the right thing. They did that with COVID and they're doing it with, with, with fair pay. We, we trust that employers will, will pay people a reasonable wage. That's why we don't need to put in any, any sorts of rules on, on that to prevent exploitation. And it's, they constantly claim to be on the side of working class people, yet every time they have a chance to help working class people, be it when working class people demand more pay, suddenly it's, oh, should stop going on strike, stop going on strike. And yet they still keep pointing at, um, at foreigners. You even had him today saying... And there's no sustainable way to achieve our goal of bringing down migration levels, which are just too high, without giving more of our own people the skills, incentives and support to get off welfare and back into work. So even while taking away the basic support from the most vulnerable people in the country, he still manages to find a way to say, but don't worry, we're still continuing with our plan to screw foreigners. Like, that's the priority here. It's the attitude that you've just articulated really well of people from certain classes being inherently trustworthy, as opposed to you have a, a number of, of people who are out of work because of mental health concerns. They must be lying. They must be mm. malingering because that the implication is that they have bad characters in the way that the CEO never could. And then equally, you could have a, a refugee who's just arrived into Dover going, I'm a dentist and Rishi Sunak being like, no, you don't want this dentist uh, fixing your teeth. Let's try and force this mentally ill person who's British to, mm -hmm. to do it. It's this idea that some people are inherently better than others that runs through everything they say and do. The, the nail you just uh, banged on just then, I hadn't thought of it that way on, on both ends of the spectrum. The we trust employers to do the right thing, but poor people are just lazy who, people who want to avoid work. It's it's so on the nose as just typically Tory that it's almost beyond parody. Is that it may not be reasonable to ask GPs who are perfectly very busy at the moment, assess whether their own patients are fit for work. It too often puts them in an impossible situation where they know that refusal to sign somebody off will harm that precious relationship with their patient. So we're also going to test shifting the responsibility for assessment from GPs and giving it to specialist work and health professionals. What do you think about that as an idea? Taking the burden away from GPs and having these new people that he's gonna to find to decide whether or not you should or shouldn't be working? That for me was the most terrifying part of that entire speech because your first question is, where are these health professionals going to come from? What will their qualifications be? We don't have enough qualified people to staff our mental health services now. So I don't think he is talking about people who have a background in psychology. I think what he's talking about are the same people who are currently working in the DWP, who have a form in front of them with boxes on it, which they use to determine whether or not you are disabled enough or poorly enough to require support. These people not only have, according to so many people I've spoken to have been through this process, no empathy for the, the situation that you may be going through, 
treat you like a criminal from the outset, but also don't have the necessary understandings of the the different types of, of disabilities and illnesses that are out there and the symptoms you can have. And they think that if you can pick up a pen, Mm-hmm. you're fit to work it also leaves us open to just all kinds of prejudice and general ideology and bias coming into it because for starters the guy that's setting this up is rishi sunak and rishi sunak if you look at his voting record has consistently in every opportunity he's had voted to lower sickness pay and against raising wel- welfare benefits so this isn't some oh we're, he's dealing with an, a newly emerging problem this is him saying my idea, my ideology that I've had for my entire time in politics, I'm just going to find a new excuse to inflict that onto people. Um, there's also, in terms of the bias and the discrimination that comes in, we know that there's a lot of discrimination within healthcare, be it in terms of minimizing the pain of ethnic minorities, women, working class people, people who the upper classes don't necessarily have that same degree of lived experience with and therefore their levels of empathy aren't going to be at the same level and that will result in if you put the take this out of the hands of people who even have the training to combat those biases and put it into your average person that is just following filling in a form risks a lot more discrimination in terms of who's deemed to be going through enough suffering that it warrants taking time off work that's exactly right. And and not only is it Rishi Sunak who is pushing through this policy, he did that speech today at the weirdly named Centre for Social Justice. Yeah, I noticed that. <laughs> I, I need to speak to the committee that names stuff about that. But praised its founder, Ian Duncan Smith, for his contribution to reform of the, the DWP. And, you know, if we remember, what was it? 2012 something like that when when universal credit came in but people lost their lives you know people Mm -hmm. ended their own life because of what that did to their lives and their Mm -hmm. finances so to hold him up as the the pinnacle of what we should be aspiring to when it comes to how we deal with society's most vulnerable tells you everything you need to know since 2019 the number of people claiming pit citing anxiety or depression as their main condition has doubled, with over 5,000 new awards on average every single month. But for all the challenges they face, it's not clear they have the same degree of increased living costs as those with physical conditions. There has been a discussion and a massive move towards treating mental health conditions in the same category as physical health conditions. And Rishi Sunak is there trying to go the exact opposite direction. To what extent do you agree with this idea of not allowing for a degree of equal treatment between those two? Well, I I think the first thing to say about that is your, your brain and your body don't exist in silos. One impacts the other. If you have a a long-term chronic pain, for example, that can affect your mental health. Um, Equally, if you have a long-term mental health issue that can start to affect you physically. And there are many physical symptoms which can be attributed. They kind of have their genesis in, in a mental health issue. So very often, I imagine that if you have a patient in front of you and if you're looking at them in a holistic way, they may have a physical and a mental health condition which both need attention. What Rishi Sunak is doing here, and again, it's classic Tory behavior, is trying to pit these two vulnerable groups against each other. So I I imagine what he's hoping is that somebody who has a physical disability, who is not getting as much support as they need and deserve, will watch that and go, yeah, you know, that's absolutely right. I, I do require more. What's the reason I'm not getting more? Oh, it's because all of those resources are going to somebody who has mental illness and in Rishi Sunak's world, in, in his view, are faking it. That's what he's hoping for. He's hoping to keep us squabbling amongst ourselves when the truth is that everybody deserves more support and the reason that they're not getting it is him. Whether some people with mental health conditions should get PIP in the same way through cash transfers or whether they'd actually be better supported to lead happier, healthier and more independent lives through access to treatment like talking therapies or respite care. Again, giving people therapeutic care or at least access to it as an option is a great idea and the conservatives have had 14 years in which to make that more widely available and they've done 
the exact opposite. You know, mental health services were one of the things that were targeted under austerity. So as the number of people asking for help has increased, the the support available to them has decreased. It's an insult to our intelligence to try and pretend that now that was an option all along and people are just choosing not to take it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, As somebody, as you know, I went through my particular mental health crisis was at the start of 2022. And I remember calling them, calling up the IAPT, the uh, access to, uh, yeah, um, and they told me, all right, we'll, uh, we'll give you a call back in six weeks. Um, and so I had to wait six weeks for that. And then get to six weeks, um, I get the call. Uh, they, I tell them, I go through everything. I cry on the phone, the whole, the whole spiel. Um, and then I hang up the phone and then three week, three days later, they send me a bunch of links to things that I could have um, uh, uh, clicked on six weeks prior. <laughs> um, and they tell me that um, uh, the ideal uh, one that I should go for would be with Mind, the health charity, um, but that the waiting list for that was 12 months. Now, wow. now, I'd already told them that I, I think the phrase is passive suicidal ideation, but I was in a much more dangerous place before then, but because I wasn't in that place right then, 12 months. Um, so telling people who can't work because of mental health issues that, oh, why don't you just get therapy? <laughs> uh, feels a little rich. Feels a little rishy. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> and his general idea was about this idea of balancing the books. That he- there is nothing compassionate about leaving a generation of young people to sit alone in the dark before a flickering screen, watching as their dreams slip further from reach every passing day. The guy that crashed the economy multiple times, whether it's through Brexit, whether it's through, by the way, him leaving Boris Johnson's cabinet led to the leadership election, which led to trust, which allowed her to then crash the economy. So he's been responsible for multiple economic crashes, saw us through the worst recession in the G7 in 2020, to then act as if the that bill should be put on the backs of the mentally unwell, rather than, um, him, uh, mm. what do you think? <laughs> there are no words for me. <laughs> there, there are no words. And he should take a look at, you know, Carol Vorderman's social media if he wants to know where all the money has gone. Exactly. Well, thank you very much, Natasha. That's been Thanks, really, really Femi. useful. Thanks, Femi. See ya. So, I'm Femi. Make sure you follow F Politics. If Politics doesn't F you, have a great week.